morning we are continuing our teaching series that I've called Summer on the Mount, a couple weeks where we're examining what is arguably the most critical portion of Scripture for Christian living. It's found in Matthew chapters 5-7, through seven, famously known as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where He touches on all topics of Christian life and faith. And so, we're going to continue our study this morning in Matthew chapter 6. I'll be reading in, starting in verse 5. Jesus speaking to the crowd says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So obviously the, uh, the topic that we're going to be discussing today from that text is the topic of prayer. And it's hard to un- underemphasize how critical prayer is in the Christian life and in our living out our faith. Prayer is conversation, it's connection to God. And, and think about how deeply and desperately we seek connection. Ever been in a modern household when the Wi Fi goes out? And all of a sudden we lose connection to the internet and to our phones and to apps and other things that we so desperately want? Or I was reminded of this last night. Graham was, uh, had the permission to go out with some of his friends with a little later curfew to go to an event than he normally has. And as the, the hours got later, the anxiety got a little higher and you'd text, everything's still going okay. And those seconds and minutes in between the response felt like they were getting longer and longer and more stressful. We crave Connection. Imagine if we desired connectivity to God with the same kind of passion and intensity that we desire connectivity to the internet, to to Wi-Fi, to each other, to responses and communication. Today we're going to be talking about the key to that connection, prayer. Prayer. Now, Jesus tells us here some important details about prayer. First of all, He says, and when you pray, do not Be like the hypocrites. Well, as Jesus is outlining for us what faithful prayer life looks like, let's take some time to examine what does he mean? What does he mean when he says, do not be like the hypocrites? Well, what's a hypocrite? We're familiar with this term. We know a hypocrite is someone whose actions do not align with their words. They say one thing and they do and move in another. So what does it mean when we pray like a hypocrite? What does that mean? What is Jesus saying to us? Well, I think that he's informing us that prayer should not be seen as some sort of magic element that can override our unfaithful activity. What does that mean, Pastor? Well, let me give you some examples. We'll start with a a lighthearted one, of course, and then we'll ramp it up a little bit. Lord, I pray for health and strength and well-being. That might be our prayer, and then our action might be, yes, I'll take two double bacon cheeseburgers, an extra large fry, and a supersized chocolate milkshake. Lord, bless this food to nourish and strengthen my body and my body for your service. Wait a minute, Pastor. Pastor. Watch where you go. Don't talk about my cheeseburger and my milkshake. Those are sacred cows. <laughs> Some of you will laugh in a minute. Lord, I pray for peace. Peace in the world. May, may Your people be unified. May all the diversity and, and adversity in our world may it be, just be dispersed. Lord, I, I pray for peace. May be our prayer, but what's our action? You know what she said? Did you hear what she said? Look what they posted online. Can you believe that? Well, I'll show them. Wait till they see what I think. 
was hypocritical prayer. Lord, I, I pray for financial blessing. I pray, pray for provision and protection. That might be our prayer. And then we say, well, what do you guys want to do next week? You want to go on vacation? Where do you want to go? Oh, well, that might be a little beyond our budget. You know what? I think we've got a little room left on that ninth credit card that we just applied for. See, when Jesus talks about, warns us about hypocritical prayer, He is informing us, reminding us that prayer is not supposed to be seen as some sort of magic formula that can override unfaithful activity. He is calling us to align our actions with our words. Prayer cannot undo all of our unfaithfulness We can't be upset that things aren't working out the way we wanted them to when none of our actions are in alignment with our desires and we just say, well, I prayed about it. I don't know why things aren't getting better. Then he says, when you pray, go into your room and close the door. Now, certainly this is to be seen in contrast with the hypocrite that he highlights in the first part of this, the one who's praying in public, the one who's putting on a show, and we're supposed to see this in contrast. Go into your room, go in private, and close the door. We see Jesus consistently highlighting the importance of private spirituality. We'll we'll talk about this in the coming weeks with some of the other spiritual disciplines that he highlights in the Sermon on the Mount. But think about how this coincides with Jesus' other teaching on dealing with things privately. What does he say? If you are in conflict with another person, if you're trying to be reconciled to them, if you're trying to be unified with them, how does he say you should approach that situation? He says, what? First of all, go to them privately. And if you can't be reconciled, if you can't work it out, if you can't be unified with that individual privately, then go see a spiritual mentor, elders, other people to help resolve the situation. Well, in the same way, if we think of prayer as our desire to be reconciled, to be unified with God, to be on the same page, moving in the same direction as God, doesn't it make sense that Jesus would say the first attempt at your prayer life is to go to God and deal with it privately, pray over it, before you go and seek other ways to deal with whatever situation you're praying over. And think about how often we fail to do this. We have a situation in our life, an issue that is causing us conflict or uneasiness. Rather than going immediately and beginning a a season of private, direct prayer and conversation and reconciliation with God, we go talk to everybody else first. We, We meet and we talk about it over coffee, we gossip about it, we might even share it online and 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 we're looking at every other way every other avenue and every other person as a way to help us reconcile the issue we're dealing with jesus tells us when you have an issue in life when you have a struggle the first thing you should do is go to seek the lord privately to to try and seek and be reconciled to god to be unified with what god is doing Think about what it means to the world when we go and try to seek other avenues of reconciliation or or resolving an issue before we go to prayer. It's actually, I believe, an offense to God's capacity. You ever been sitting with someone and they're dealing with an issue and and it's an issue you're capable of resolving, but they just kind of bypass you and say, well, you know, I'll, I'll find somebody else. Maybe you're sitting there uh, with your spouse and they say, you know, uh, that light bulb in the dining room is out. I think I'll call somebody to have them fix it. Well, I can fix that. Kind of hurts our pride a little bit, right? When somebody has an issue that we could resolve, but they don't come to us or we could help them with that. Think about how God feels when we take our issues, our struggles, our challenges, and rather than bringing them to God first to be resolved, to find peace, to find resolution. We go everywhere else to everyone else, and when nothing else works, we say, okay, well, maybe I'll pray about it. Jesus is highlighting here 
we should not do an end run around God. Our first response when we come into a season or situation of conflict, our first response is immediately go to the Lord in a, in, a, in a season, a situation of personal prayer. Then look what he says. When you pray, go into your room and close the door. Again, I think Jesus is putting an emphasis here on a situation where we can be drawn to reflection. Then he says, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Well, now we've got your attention, right? Because now we feel like we've got some sort of key to this magical transaction. If I do these things, if I go in secret, if I close the door, if I uh, do this in private, if I don't pray hypocritical, if I go through this checklist, then what? Your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Doesn't that mean I can get what I want? Whatever I pray for, if I go through the right sequence of actions, if I do the right things, then God will reward me. God will give me what I want. Is that what Jesus is saying here? It really taps into the broader topic of whether or not I can influence God's will with my prayer. In fact, it's a topic that we talked about Wednesday morning in our, our men's group, and if, and if that's a, a question that you're pondering this morning, I want to I propose to you just a, a fuller understanding of what Jesus is saying here. If our prayer is an attempt to align our spirit and our action with God's will, rather than our attempt to align God's Spirit and God's action with our will, two very different, significant approaches to prayer. Understand what I just said. Our prayer tends to be, and most people I've been around with and prayed with, I, I've noticed two tendencies. Either we are striving to, uh, to uh, align our spirit and our action with God's will, or we're praying in an attempt to align God's spirit and God's action with our will. I would suggest to you that if we're in that first camp, if we are seeking to align ourselves, our spirit, our action with God's will, then yes, we will experience the reward that Jesus promised. Now, what is that reward? Does that mean you get what you want? You get what you prayed for? Well... I would push back with this. It's been my experience that while you will experience a reward when we tend our prayers to seek God's will, that reward may not be what we thought we wanted. And that reward may be what the country musicians call unanswered prayers. And maybe we've all been there. We've all experienced the blessing of unanswered prayers. Meaning we prayed in one direction. Lord, I pray that I get accepted to that college. Lord, I pray that that person will go on a date with me and I pray that we get married. Lord, I pray that I get that promotion in Tulsa. And we think so intently, so desperately that this is what we want. This is where we need to be going. And, and those things don't come to fruition. And perhaps we go through a season of disappointment and despair. But through the benefit of time and perspective, we can look back and say, Lord, thank you that I did not go to that school. That I did not date or marry that person. That I did not end up in Tulsa. See, we can realize that we have been rewarded. It may not be in, in the ways of we get what we thought we wanted, what we were praying for, but we have been rewarded. We have been protected. We have experienced what God had in mind. Because you cannot read this first part without reading the last part of this. Jesus says, Your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. But then He concludes, For your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. And isn't that really the key, the motivation here? The motivation for us seeking to align our will and our attitudes and our actions to God's will instead of the other way around? We, we recognize that God knows what we need before we even ask Him. 
And friends, doesn't it make sense? If, if we truly believe that God is omniscient, God knows everything perfectly. That God has a perfect will and the, the best idea and the best plan. That God has perfect love for us. If we, if we truly believe and understand these things about God, that God has perfect knowledge, the perfect plan, and the perfect love for us, if we truly believe those things, then why would we ever take our imperfect knowledge, our imperfect plans, our imperfect love, and say, hey God, I know you have the perfect knowledge, the perfect love, the perfect plan, but I've got an imperfect knowledge, an imperfect plan, an imperfect love. Why don't we do it my way? Why would we ever do that if we truly believe and know and understand that God knows all things perfectly? That God's will is perfect. That God's love is perfect. That God wants the best for us. And then in, Jesus goes on to say, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. Do not use too many words when you pray. Now I know you want to say, hey, pastor, pastor, Read that again, and don't be a hypocrite, right? But what are we really saying? Don't use too many words. Doesn't, aren't we called in Scripture to pray without ceasing? Nonstop prayer all the time? What does Jesus mean when he says, do not use too many words in your prayer? Well, as I was reflecting on this teaching, this principle of Jesus, I thought of two things. First of all, I thought about times when I'm the recipient of too many words, a time when I'm in authority position to uh, make a decision and I receive too many words. Dad, am I allowed to go? No. But can I? No. But please, I want? No. But I want to? No. What, what are they trying to do when I receive a whole bunch of words? Wear me down. Okay, fine, go ahead, whatever, I'm tired of talking about it. Okay, so our first attempt many times when we use a bunch of words is to wear God down. <laughs> Rather than surrendering to whatever plan, whatever purpose, whatever God has in mind, we try to continue to convince and negotiate God to our imperfect plan, our imperfect will, our imperfect love, our imperfect idea. And if we just keep asking Maybe we'll wear God down. Now, the other aspect I see in this instruction, do not use too many words, is notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say use, don't use too much time in prayer. When, when Jesus says don't use too many words, I think it's important for us to understand he's not talking about shortening your prayer. He's not talking about reducing your time in prayer. He's talking about what? Reducing your words. If we understand and believe prayer to be a conversation between us and God, what does that mean? You, you know there's two parts of conversation. Talking and listening. Maybe some of us need to be reminded there's a second part of conversation. Listening is a part of an important, integral part of conversation. So when, when Jesus says to us, do not use too many words in your prayer, he doesn't say don't use too much time. He's not telling us to shorten our time in prayer. He's telling us to mind our words. I believe it's an invitation to more active, open, intentional listening in prayer. I think so many Christians, even those who have an active, expressive prayer life, many of us still struggle to have an active, receptive prayer life. We ask God for guidance. We ask God for direction. We ask God for insight and understanding, and then we fail to intentionally listen. Can you imagine a student who goes to their math teacher? I'm really having a hard time understanding these problems in Algebra 2. And I'm really, uh, you know, I, I uh, probably shared with you before, I was a veteran of Algebra 6. Um, that doesn't exist. I just took Algebra 2 three times, so at the end I've called it Algebra 6. But uh, 
You imagine a student coming to their math teacher, I'm really struggling to understand, to figure this out, to, to figure out how to work through this, can you help me? The teacher says, sure, I'd be glad to help you. And the student says, great. And they walk away and leave the classroom. Why would you ask somebody for help, for guidance, for wisdom, for knowledge that, that you don't have? And when they agree to give it to you, you, you leave the conversation before receiving their wisdom. And yet that happens so often in our prayer life. We use all of our words. We talk, we talk, we talk, we share. We ask for help, we ask for guidance. And then we leave the conversation before we li listen. I also think when Jesus says this, he's also, uh, once again, putting an emphasis on action. He says, don't use too many words. Does the Bible ever warn us about doing too many good actions, too many right things? No, nowhere in Scripture. I'll, I'll just cut it off here so you don't have to bring it to stump the pastor tonight. There's nowhere in Scripture that Jesus or the prophets or the apostles or anybody warns us about spending too much time listening to God or too much time doing the right things. In fact, Paul in Galatians says, don't grow weary of doing the right things. The only thing we're warned about is using too many words. We're not warned, you know, hey, hey, don't listen to God too much. Don't do the right action too often. We're warned not to grow weary of doing those things. And so when Jesus says, do not speak with too many words and pray with too many words, I don't think he's diminishing our time in prayer. I think he's inviting us to listen to God actively, intentionally. And then act as we are inspired to act. Let me deal with the one last question that I think would pop up. When Jesus says here, uh, if your Father in heaven already knows what you need. There was a time in my spiritual life when I was younger when I would read that and say, great, then I don't need to pray. God's got it covered, knows what I need. I can free up some time for some other activities. Why do I need to pray? Well, hopefully that we've seen the answer to this already this morning. That we understand prayer, appropriate, faithful prayer, is aligning ourselves. It's the activity of being open to what God is up to, to listening for wisdom and guidance and direction. To, if, if God already knows what we need, if God already has the perfect idea, prayer is our opportunity to sink into that perfect idea, to grasp it for ourselves. Perhaps this principle is best illustrated in a story, a story about a man named Hudson Taylor. Perhaps you know his name. Hudson Taylor was a well-known missionary that took the gospel to China and, and traveled all over to China with revivals and preaching and, and baptism and bringing people to faith. Well, when Hudson Taylor was uh, traveling to China uh, initially, the, the boat he was on was in a desperate situation. The wind had totally died down. It was completely gone. The current was carrying the boat towards some reefs. And uh, it was a well-known reef. It was a very dangerous passage for ships in that day. And, and they were uh, destined to hit those rocks. To make it even worse, just beyond those rocks was an island that was inhabited by cannibals. And uh, Hudson Taylor recorded in his journal that they could already see the fires on the beach being lit by the cannibals as their ship approached. There was no wind. There was nothing the sailors on the boat can do. The captain came to Hudson Taylor and said, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. We just got to prepare ourselves. We've tried everything. We don't know what else to do. And Hudson Taylor said, well, there's one more thing we can do. And he and the three other missionaries that were with him said, we're going to go back to our quarters, to our cabins, and we're going to intently pray. And so they did. And in the midst of that prayer, in the midst of his listening, Hudson Taylor just felt this conviction the Lord was about to bring a wind. And so he stopped. He went up to the deck. He told the first officer, he said, a wind is coming. Lower the sails. 
Initially, the first officer refused, said, there's no wind. We've been looking for wind this entire time. There's no wind. But, but after a conversation and dialogue, finally, they lowered the sails. You know what's going to happen, right? At the perfect time, a wind comes. The, uh, the, the captain and the crew are able to regain control of the ship, steer them away from the reef, and in to safety. Now, some people might hear that story. And they might place an emphasis that God brought the wind. What a miracle. And I don't want to diminish that. God's perfect knowledge, perfect timing, perfect plan. God brought that wind at the perfect time. But I don't want you to miss the other aspect of this. Maybe God was going to bring that wind anyway. Maybe that wind was already coming. What's the, what's the real key to this story? It's that Hudson Taylor stopped to pray. And when he stopped to pray, and when he listened, and when he heard, and when he was convicted that the wind was coming, he had an appropriate action. They went up and lowered the sails. Without that prayer without that listening, without that action, the wind would have come and gone. The sails would have been up, and the ship would have headed for the reef. See that, friends, that's, that's the power of prayer. Prayer aligns us with what God is about to do. Prayer opens our sails to receive the wind of God, the movement of the Spirit, and be a part of the incredible things that God is about to do. Amen. 